So in this video, we'll use Scaras to analyze the MNIST dataset. Um, and we will use convolutional neural networks to have a better output prediction on our test data set, a better output accuracy on our test data set than what we would get in regular artificial neural networks without convolutional layer. And that's, of course, caused by the fact that this, these convolutional layers are extracting features from an image and are, in some sense, more uh, invariant under shifts of those features within the image. So what we'll do is we'll import or we'll load um, Keras. So we'll import Keras here. We'll import a couple of the other things that we'll need, in particular, these dense layers, dropout layers, which I'll talk about, uh, flattening or pooling layers or convolutional layers. We'll use a batch size of 128. So that means we'll take, um, we'll, we'll try 128 times to minimize the, the loss on the stochastic gradient descent. Um, and we'll do this 12 times. This is again to improve um, the situation with respect to overfitting. And we'll map this onto 10 classes or images are 28 by 28. We'll load our data from the MNIST data set. So here we're using the Keras data sets routine that returns an X and Y training set and an X and Y test data set. So we don't actually have to split this up ourselves anymore. Um, then sometimes the data set is stored differently. So this just takes care of that. Um, we'll turn our training data again from integer digits from zero to 255 into floating point digits that are normalized between zero and one. And then we can look at how many training samples and test samples we have. So as you can see, it's loading our TensorFlow backend for Keras, uh, or it's using the TensorFlow backend. It's loading the MNIST data set directly from Amazon Web Services here. We have 60,000 training samples. So we have the same separation as we did before. That's the default for the MNIST data set. And then we have 10,000 test samples. So let's first reproduce what we did before with a regular artificial neural network without convolution layer. So what we did is we um, had a single layer of 100 nodes, a single hidden layer of 100 nodes. And the activation function was, was ReLU. So we'll try to repeat that here in Keras. What we do is we create a model by saying that we'll sequentially add additional layers to the model. So we start with adding a dense, or in other words, a fully connected regular artificial neural network layer, a hidden layer of 100 nodes, 100 neurons, with activation function equal to ReLU. And so the input shape will, of course, be our 784 input pixels. Then we add a dropout layer. What this does is it, um, it avoids overfitting by randomly setting 20%, 0.2, of the input of the output nodes, output um, values of the previous layer to zero. And so at the input of the next layer, it will just take those zeros and try to work with the other 80% of the values. So what this does is it avoids that the neural network gets stuck in a particular set of um, input output connections that is basically training um, or it, it's being trained to recognize the training data rather than the um, than uh, test data or the, the features that are in the training data. So this dropout layer is another way that we can use, uh, is another approach that we can use to avoid overfitting, um, similar to what we've already done, for example, with regularization. So I've disabled this additional hidden layer here and another dropout layer, but then the last layer is just our connection from the previous layer or a hundred hidden layer nodes to num classes or 10 classes. Now what we use here is activation equals softmax. Softmax is essentially what we would um, do if we had a logistic regression. So we introduce our probabilities, um, but it is something that um, also works for multiple classes, not just a binary yes, no um, decision. So that's our model. Um, we can print a summary of that model in Keras. So we have our dense layer with 100 neurons. Um, we have our dropout layer with 100 neurons. Obviously, it doesn't change anything. And then we have another dense layer that brings our 100 neurons down to 10. And we can look at the number of parameters here. So if we go from uh, 784 input parameters 
um, to our input features, input pixels, to 100 hidden layer neurons, then there will be 100 times 784 weights, and then there's another 100 biases for each of those hidden layer neurons, so we get 78,500. And then here in the dense layer, we, ha we go down from 100 nodes to 10 nodes, so that's 100 times 10 weights plus an additional 10 weights. So indeed, that makes sense. That's our same 79,510 parameters that we're training for as we did before. Uh, we'll use the regular cross entropy loss. Um, we'll use a specific optimizer, which just goes a little bit better. Um, there's, you know, we could use stochastic gradient descent. There's other optimizers, which one of the um, popular ones is Adam. And so eta delta is similar to this Adam optimizer. And then we'll keep as a metric some of this accuracy so we can actually look at the accuracy afterwards. So that compiles the model. It essentially turns it into very efficient code. So now what we'll do is we'll do the training. We'll fit our training data in both X and Y to our model. Before we do that, since we take our pixels as input, our 784 pixels as input, we'll want to reshape our training data from our 28 by 28 uh, image maps to 784 linear uh, lists of pixels. So we'll do that with our batch, and then we'll train with the batch size epoch. Um, we'll want some uh, some output, and then we'll give it the validation data, which is our, our test um, set in X and Y, to periodically print out our, uh, how well we're doing on that validation set. So as you can see, it will go through these 12 epochs. It takes about five seconds per step, so that's relatively fast. Um, you can see that on our training data, we get a certain loss and an accuracy, which improves for each epoch. But also our, our validation loss and accuracy are printed here. So we started off after one training epoch, we had 0 0.93.9, so 93.9, 94% accuracy. But as we continue training, when we have done um, 12 epochs, we'll get about 90, 97.8, 97.9% accuracy on our validation. So that's exically what we got before with scikit-learn as well. Um, essentially this, uh, this additional um, dropout layer hasn't necessarily changed all that much, um, but that's not what we were trying to demonstrate here anyway. So, so we still have a 97.8% accuracy without convolutional neural networks. We could try to improve this by, for example, enabling an additional hidden layer, increasing this hidden layer to 512 um, neurons. So our model will look differently now. We have many more trainable parameters from 79,000. We went, that, went, went up to 670,000. We can compile our model. We can train this. So similarly, um, we'll see the increase in the accuracy on our validation set. So this will take slightly longer, not all that much longer. Um, as you can see, the accuracy on our validation set is indeed increasing as we keep training from, uh, from one epoch to the next. So we're getting slightly higher already at 98.3 here, where we went up from 97.8. And there we are. We have 98.4 as our maximum accuracy. So remember what this means, though. Um, on this, this accuracy of 98.4 on our test set of 10,000 digits would still mean that about uh, 1,500 digits, uh, or uh, let's see, uh, 150 digits are misclassified. So on a test data set of about 10,000, that is, a, or no, actually it is 1,500. So it's a large number of digits that are uh, misclassified. So let's see what uh, convolutional networks can 
can bring for us now. So we'll do the same thing. We'll start our model. We'll build it up sequentially, but we'll start off with a convolutional layer. Um, it will be a convolutional layer with 32 kernels that are each three by three kernels and I have activation again with given by ReLU. And the input shape is our input shape of our 28 by 28 by one, which is what we actually defined up above. Then we'll have a second convolutional layer, which takes the output of our kernel, of, of our convolutional layer, our first convolutional layer. It will again have a, a kernel size of three by three. There's going to be 64 filters, and we'll again use ReLU as the activation. Then we'll do a pooling layer. So we'll do downsampling based on the maximum in each two by two, um, two by two square. We'll have a dropout layer. We'll flatten this from pixels into a linear array, and then we'll introduce a regular dense artificial neural network layers, which are fully connected. So this is going to be 128 hidden neurons. Again, ReLU activation, another dropout layer, and then finally a dense layer to go to our 10, uh, uh, 10 classification um, possibilities, and we'll use softmax as an activation here. So we can pl plot the model summary. So naturally, whenever we introduce convolutional neural networks, we have a lot of parameters that are introduced through that. Um, so here our trainable number of parameters actually mainly coming through our, our flattened dense layer here going from 6,216 um, nodes at the end of this flattened layer in our fully connected layer to 128 nodes. So this introduces over a million different parameters. So now we can, again, compile this model. We can uh, reshape our training data, which we reshaped before into uh, a 784 linear array. So now we need to reshape it back into an image array of 28 by 28 with one channel of information, just black, white, so it's essentially a, a grayscale um, channel of information. If we had a red, green, blue image, then we would, for example, have um, three channels here, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. So now we're using a, a 28 by 28 by one um, channel input image. So, and then we train this. This is essentially the same code that we wrote before. Thanks to our GPUs, this actually runs in less than 100 seconds or less than 200 seconds per epoch. So um, it's about 12 seconds per epoch, so don't do this uh, on a regular client in, uh, uh, in Google Collaboratory because you'll be waiting here for much longer. One thing you see here is that we have 98.2% um, uh, accuracy on our validation set already right from our first epoch. So our second, third, I think here at our fourth epoch, we might already be in 99% um, accuracy, close to 99%, 989 So the convolution layer really does seem to um, in introduce a better performance on our uh, test data set. So this is of course not necessarily surprising because what we what we introduced our convolution layer for is exactly to be able to recognize those shifts of the numbers, um, the, the invariance of the features with respect to where they are in the image. So obviously it's taking a little bit longer than our previous regular neural network that didn't have the convolution layer because of just the sheer um, size of the um, image maps and, and the kernel and the convolutions that we have to do. As you might remember when we looked at convolutions in the digital signal processing context, that was also a very expensive, long um, operation on, on time signals. So here the same thing is true on our image um, signals. So our, vali uh, our validation set accuracy here is now consistently almost over 99%. So um, if we look at our final value now, with our convolutional neural network, we're at 99.16% um, accuracy. So of this, uh, this new neural network, uh, about, um, s about 840 characters of our 10,000 test characters 
have been misclassified. So 840 is a is of course a um, a pretty good uh, score for uh, for this task. Okay, so that was the last thing I wanted to show was to use these uh, convolutional neural networks, which really allow you to um, experiment much more with um, image recognition and finding features in images. So, for example, if you have a large number of um, images that are taken of a, a cell culture and you're trying to identify a feature in those um, images, then convolutional neural network networks might be your way to go. Um, similarly, of course, more data than we've presented here can be presented as images. It doesn't have to be an actual image. It could be um, a set of measurements at geographic locations, which you would never represent as an image, but which still has a two-dimensional nature um, where the, the proximity of individual pixels to each other or individual measure measurements to each other could um, reproduce patterns. So, for example, if you could represent um, the, the measurements in terms of uh, latitude, longitude, location, and you have a lot of data that way. Um, think, for example, temperature measurements at different positions. So if you have that input, you could also use convolutional neural network tools to um, the extract the features from that grid-like um, measurement data. So I hope um, you'll be able to, uh, to take away something from this, uh, this last step, this convolutional neural network step that might be useful in your work as well.